Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Timey Wimey Tuesday here on the Multimedia Chronicles. Well, once again, I have been slacking. Well, I haven't really been slacking. I've actually been working on some stuff behind the scenes, and it's just been taking a little longer than expected. But uh, just about ready to go. So time to start doing videos again. And to make it up to you, I actually have two today. Two for Tuesday. Two for Tuesday. Yeah. I was going to do another rhyme there, but that's really it. Um, so first up, I thought I'd give you an update on how the Target Books collection is coming along. Yeah, got a few uh, new additions in recent weeks. I thought we'd take a look at them and, uh, and see how it's coming along. So let's check it out. Target Books update today on Timey Wimey Tuesday on the Multimedia Chronicles. Welcome back. Alrighty, well, as you know, I have been very keen to fill in the gaps in my first and second Doctor uh, collections of the Target Books novelizations, mainly because I want to do super duper uber deluxe story by story reviews of the entire classic series. That's all 160 stories. That's including the TV movie and Shada as story numbers. Um, numbers one, one, 160 for the movie and 109 for Shada, respectively. Hey, I'm just a big nerd. Anyway, um, so I wanted to show you how it's coming along. I'm happy to report it's come along so well that next week, the first of the story-by-story -story reviews will be appearing. I'm, of course, talking about... An Unearthly Child. Yes, the very first Doctor Who story ever. I used to have this book many moons ago. I talked about it actually in the, uh, in the I guess, the first of the Target Memories series of videos that I did. Um, well, it's back, baby. I got it back in the collection. This is the exact edition I had, too. In fact, I think this is the only edition they've ever done of it, come to think of it. I know it was really, really late that they did this one. I don't know why. When was this originally published? It was like... 1981, yeah, so the 18th anniversary of Doctor Who, so there you go, so finally got an, un an unearthly child back in the collection, love this just simple painted cover of the, the TARDIS in the junkyard, great uh, great way to start it off, because that, that's how it starts, and there you go, very, very nice, so yeah, so there you go, so story number one, I have it again at last, which means I can begin the story-by-story -story reviews, but we're not stopping there. Oh, no, because uh, this is another one. I used to have this exact edition, and now I have it again. Story number two, Doctor Who and the Daleks. Yes, very, very cool. Um, this is an interesting one because th this was actually the very first Doctor Who novelization ever. This was not the first edition. There were several editions prior to this. But uh, an interesting uh, beast in that not only historically significant in that it was the first novelization ever, but also because it's actually all written in the first person. The entire book is actually from Ian Chesterton's perspective. So it's, it's his viewpoint of all the various events of the story. And... Uh, yeah, pretty cool. I've never actually read it. I've just kind of skimmed it before, so I'm really looking forward to checking this one out as part of the review series. Next up, uh, this one, I, I don't know why, but for some reason the paperback seemed to be going for exorbitant sums of money, yet the hardcover edition was far more affordable. We're talking a difference of like 30, 40 bucks. It was ridiculous. And then since getting the hardcover edition, thinking, well, I'll just get the hardcover because it's cheaper. Um... I was poking around looking for some of the other ones I needed, and I saw the paperback of this all over the place going for peanuts. And I'm like, well, what the hell? Why wasn't that the case two weeks ago when I was looking for it? Anyway, we have story number three, The Edge of Destruction in uh, hardback. There you go. Pretty cool. Stereo hardback. Yeah, there we go. So, I don't know, pretty cool. 
I, I'm not really too picky, obviously. I mean, I'm not overly picky about condition, just that, you know, the cover not being tatters and whatnot. But, um, and this is, uh, this is actually an X library book. You can see some tags on the side there. And then inside, it looks like it's had the, uh, the binding redone and there's some labels, <laughs> some stamps on it and stuff. In fact, almost all of these have something written in them. Actually, no. Wow, an unearthly child is almost mint, except for a couple little uh, nicks on the cover there. This one's in, uh, you know, fairly well-read condition. Does it have anything written inside? No, it doesn't. So, yeah, not bad. It's just it's a well well enjoyed book. So that's pretty cool. I don't I don't mind that. I mean, I t to me, I I mean, I I'm a big fan of reading and encouraging reading. So. When I get a book from a used bookstore, knowing that it's been enjoyed and loved before, um, it just warms my heart, you know. So, uh, as you may recall, I got stories 4, 5, and 6, namely Marco Polo, The Keys of Marinus, and The Aztecs from the massive package of books that Quack sent. So, basically filling in gaps right now. So, next up, we have story number 7, The Sensorites. Yes. This one... Um, this one goes for a little bit more than some of the others. I don't know why. Guessing slightly lower print run. Anything written in this one? No. Nope. Actually, really nice condition on this one, too. And uh, slightly longer novelization, I noticed, which is appropriate. I mean, it was a six-part story. Smaller print, too. I don't know how well you can tell. Like, if you look at the print in this and compare it to An Unearthly Child, which is virtually large print... <laughs> This is taking me no time at all to read. I've actually been kind of taking my time with it just to draw it out a bit. Um, yeah, so uh, for a while there, the Target books kind of had a mandate that the novelizations couldn't be more than uh, like 128 pages. And then uh, eventually they lifted that and novelizations were done longer. So this is obviously done after the mandate because this is like almost 150 pages. These, so this one is uh, from the pre-Target era. Target just reprinted it, so that's like almost 150 pages. This is one of the 128 pages. This is one of the 128 pages. Um, yeah. So then next up, we have story number eight, The Reign of Terror. This one actually just arrived the other day. I, I'd kind of forgotten it was on the way. I just I placed this massive order, all these different... Uh, sellers on Amazon and eBay just to fill in the gaps looking for the best basically this is what I love about shopping online comparative shopping man I just sought out the best deals going and grabbed uh, whatever I could so very very nice this one is written by Ian Martyr Harry Sullivan himself he wrote uh, a number of the Doctor Who novelizations so that's uh, that's quite cool next up this one goes for a pretty penny so I wasn't being overly picky about condition this one is in slightly rougher shape we have story number nine, Planet of Giants. Now this one is, uh, this one's quite a lot shorter actually. It's only 112 pages and just gigantic print. <laughs> so I imagine this one isn't gonna take too long. And looking on Amazon, this is one of the worst reviewed novelizations too. They said it's like full of errors and typos and stuff like that. Actually reading An Unearthly Child, I did find one typo where Susan was mis uh, misprinted as Sudan. Yeah, kind of weird. Anyway, Planet of Giants, very cool. I don't care what anybody says. I'm looking forward to reading that one anyway, just to kind of see what the differences are. Uh, this one I used to have. Uh, this one's in pretty rough shape. I, I'm probably going to try to track down a better copy of this uh, at some point. We have story number 10, The Dalek Invasion of Earth. Now, I swear, the edition that I had, it was also the diamond logo, but I swear that it also had the blue rather than the orange. So I'm guessing there was a couple of printings of that, unless I'm just misremembering it, which is entirely possible. Yeah, we don't have any uh, anything here. But you can, you can probably see the, I don't know if you can see, like there's like major creasing <laughs> on the cover and on the spine and stuff. So, I don't know. I, I might track down a nicer quality copy of that at some point, or a nicer condition. And next up, uh, I, of course, have story 11, thanks to Quack. And then I have, uh, and then I picked up story number 12, The Romans. Very cool. This one's in really nice shape, actually. Very impressed. And this is kind of interesting. This kind of reminds me of how the original Dracula was, because um, 
I don't know how well you can see this, but the entire thing is not done in a straightforward narrative style. It's actually done in the form of extracts from uh, do official documents and diaries and personal writings and such. So kind of an interesting take on, uh, on the story. You got things from the doctor's diary and Ian Chesterton's notes and... Uh, where is it here? Yeah, from the personal journal of Ian Chesterton. So, kind of interesting. Looking forward to checking this one out. Um, this is one of my favorite historical adventures. Actually, honestly, I like a lot of the historical adventures from the early series because that's when they really, you know, they, they did it more seriously where it was just, you know, people from the future going back and checking out a significant event from the past. And uh, I just, I like that honesty about them. The fact that we were kind of seeing history from the perspective of these time travelers as they're living it and experiencing it firsthand. And I like that. I like that aspect of it. We don't really see that very much in the show anymore and uh, haven't for a very long time. In fact, I think the last, you know, the last sort of, the, the last 60s era, like straight up historical story uh, was the Highlanders, which was like Patrick Troughton's second story. Uh, and then it was mostly science fiction from then on with some, you know, occasional journeys into the past, obviously. And it wasn't until Black Orchid, like way, way later in the 80s, like literally almost 20 years later, um, where we had Black Orchid, a fifth Doctor story, which was the first straight up historical. And it was only a two parter. And it wasn't a particularly notable event in history either. It was just they went into the past and there was nothing alien going on, you know. But uh, but these ones, I mean, the, the historical adventures of this era, they would go back to significant points in history or significant events and experience them firsthand. And that, to me, is a cool way to do a time travel story where you're going into the past. And, and you still don't really see that anymore. I mean, yes, there have been stories in the new series that have gone back into the past, quite a few, in fact. But uh, there's always something alien or supernatural or something going on. It's never just a straight-up historical adventure anymore. And uh, I kind of miss that. It would be, it'd be nice to, to see that, actually. You know? Um, I, I don't think it's a bad thing to just have a story that shows us a piece of history from the perspective of the time travelers, you know? And then next up we have, um, I've had, uh, I've got stories 13 and 14, uh, The Web Planet, or The Zarbi is the novelization, and The Crusades, or the, the Crusade was the televised story, the novel is The Crusaders, which were, by the way, the second and third novelizations pre-Target era. Um, I have, of course, the Target reprint editions. Um, and then I've had the Space Museum, which is story number 15 for quite some time. Uh, I forget where I picked up. I picked up a used bookstore here on the island somewhere. Uh, so then picked up story number 16, The Chase, which is a lot of fun. Great stuff. Introduces Stephen, bids farewell to the original, the rest of the original TARDIS crew, namely uh, Ian and Barbara. And uh, and that's pretty cool. This was, uh, this was a really late addition to the novelizations this is number 140 and uh in, in the target library uh published in 1989 so this was actually published the year the series was canceled that's how late in the game this one was uh i know it was it was a long time coming and uh, a lot of the dalek stories just kind of lingered for a while and fans were wondering if they were ever going to get adaptation some of them actually didn't even come out in novelized form until the after the Target era, but in the Virgin era, when Virgin was doing the Doctor Who books, they did uh, Power of the, the Daleks and Evil of the Daleks, which Target just never got around to, I guess because I think there was some rights issues at the time, which Target wasn't able to circumvent, but, um, or, you know, not circumvent. That's, that implies they were trying to do something sneaky uh, to, you know, get to work with, um, whereas uh, Virgin was able to make it happen. So here we have, then we have story number 17, The Time Meddler. This is another one that tends to go for a fair amount. I, I, I don't remember specific, honestly, I don't remember specifically what I paid for all of these. I know that some are more than others. This was one of the more expensive ones, just because for whatever reason, I, I guess, again, low print run or, or something. Low print run and high demand, I guess, because it's a pretty, you know, significant story. First time we see one of the Doctor's people other than himself. And there is some writing inside. It says, First Doctor, William Hartnell. So obviously someone was, uh, you know, had their own sort of system for keeping track of them. Uh, now, as as for me, I just look at the story and I know which doctor it is because I'm a big nerd. But uh, there you go. So then next up, uh, yeah, now now this one uh, I, I definitely had to uh, take a hit on the condition 
because the the okay this story they published in two parts just because it is such a freaking massive story this is another one that was really late in the game it's actually uh is it was this is number 140 then number 141 and 142 in the target library with this was this two-part story so i got part two of the daleks master plan the mutation of time yeah, so the original story of this was 12 parts, 13 if you count, if you count Mission to, to the Unknown, which of course you should count because it's part of the story. Um, yeah, I almost had Mission to the Unknown. I actually ordered it the other day, found a place that was selling it cheap. I placed the order, I was all excited, like, wow, I got a great deal, it was like 20 bucks, which is a good price for that one. Um, and, and then they canceled the order because apparently they didn't actually have it in stock after all. So I looked at all the other listings. Nothing was even close to as good a price. So I'm just going to keep my eye out on it. I mean, doing the story-by-story -story reviews, I'm looking to do them once every couple of weeks. I'm looking kind of a bi-weekly schedule. So I'm not going to be up to this one for quite a while. So I've got some time. Um, yes, and it is not mutated. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I, I don't know how well you can see, but there's... There's like some major water damage to the pages here. <laughs> and, uh, it's pretty, uh, it's in pretty rough shape. But, uh, but yeah, so it's like towards the end of the target run, uh, they're just like, oh my god, we got the rights to do all these Dalek stories. Quick, rush them out. So they did like the chase and, and the, uh, I love these covers, by the way. Beautiful, beautiful painted covers. Um, yeah, and then they did that. So that's story 21. Oh, that's another thing, actually. He, uh, Whoever had this before was numbering them by story number on the spine. It's kind of cool. So, uh, yeah, so you had Mission to the Unknown originally, which fit in between um, uh, Galaxy 4 and um, uh, the Myth Makers. Then you had the Myth Makers, and then you had the Daleks Master Plan. So the Daleks Master Plan was just this big, massive 12-part story. Uh, so in the novelization, obviously, they put Mission to the Unknown together with it. Um, notable episode, by the way, because it was the one and only episode that didn't feature any of the regular cast in it. It was all supporting characters that you wouldn't really meet until the, uh, the main story uh, four weeks later. So it's kind of interesting the way they structured that. And then finally, last but most certainly not least, we have story number 23 the arc so there you go so pretty cool so uh i've got a few coming in the mail at the moment uh sadly not part one of the daleks master plan but um what have i got coming i got the smugglers which i got really lucky on that's another one that goes for a lot um so i managed to snag that one fairly inexpensively um i also have the savages and the war machines so those three are on their way and all that leaves is part one of the Dalek Master Plan and the Massacre. The Massacre goes really cheap. The only reason I didn't get it was I, it was I had just a little bit too little on my Amazon gift card to get that one. So I'll get that one next time. But um, ordering from Amazon.com, I really take a hit on shipping, being in Canada. Um, so it's great to get the gift cards because then I don't really have to spend my own money. It's just mysterious, magical internet money. Um, that turns into actual physical goods. It's it's amazing the way that works. But, um, yeah, so I'll get that one next time, and I'll just keep an eye out for uh, for the uh, the first part of this. And if I can luck out and find a better condition uh, copy of this one. But in the meantime, at least I've got a good, uh, you know, good reading copy. Ah, so there you go. So only two to go, and I'll have all of the first Doctor novelizations. Every single story. Pretty cool. Now, you may be wondering, hey, Sean, what are you going to do about the missing stories? Well, I've decided I'm going to review those two because I want to be thorough and the novels exist and I'm doing both the novels and the DVDs. So, um, yeah, so when we get up to the missing stories, I'll review those stories as well. As far as the televised version, I'll just watch, you know, obviously whatever episodes do exist, if any, and, uh, and likely just watch a fan you know, photo snap reconstruction of some kind with the original soundtrack, obviously. That's the way I watched them before, the last time I went through the early episodes, so that's that's likely what I'll do again, uh, just so I've got, you know, something to go by as far as the televised versions go. Alrighty, that is it for this episode. I will see you later on today, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific.
is kind of the schedule idea here. So this should be up at 6 a.m. and the next one will be up at 6 p.m. Uh, if you're on the other side of the world, I have no idea what time that will be. Maybe it's not even Tuesday anymore. I don't know. Anyway, quick thank you to my Patreon sponsors. Thanks, Patreon sponsors. You guys and gals are awesome. So thanks. Especially uh, Kyle Pellegrin and Get Your Gorgeous On, the awesome EMAG maintained by Michelle O'Toole and Simon Hedger. Thank you very much for the ongoing support, guys. Really appreciate it. They are, of course, my highest level sponsors, so they get the... The bonus perk of a verbal shout-out. Yeah! Name and lights, man. Alrighty. That is it from me to you for now. So until next time, thanks for watching, and sayonara.